It's late morning on the 22nd of November, 1952. Four Lockheed F-80 shooting stars of the US 80th Fighter Bomber Squadron carve through the skies of Kunwa, North Korea, not far from a landform known as Sniper Ridge. Leading the pack is one Major Charles J. Loring Jr., a warrior hardened in the fires of the Second World War. His radio crackles to life and he receives the following intel. A Chinese artillery battery is pinning down UN ground forces on Sniper Ridge. Loring adjusts his flight path and rolls into a dive bombing run which will turn the Chinese position into a smoking crater. There's a terrible clang followed by two more. Near the Chinese artillery position, AA batteries are spitting defensive fire into the nose and fuselage of Loring's F-80. Smoke sheets the plane and Loring's wingmen are screaming for him to abort, but Loring doesn't follow the old adage of living to fight another day. For him, there's only the here and now. We return to Korea to tell a tale of duty and sacrifice, this time spotlighting the career pilot Charles G. Loring Jr. of the United States Air Force. Let's get stuck right into it. Charles Joseph Loring Jr. was born in Portland, Maine in October 1918 and graduated from Cheveris High School in 1937. Other than that, we unfortunately know little about Loring's pre-military life. Some four years after Loring finished school, however, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and goaded the United States into the Second World War. A man of 23, Loring signed up for the US Army. By March 1942, he was serving as a private in the US Army Air Corps. By May, Loring was training as a cadet at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. And after completing a number of flight training programs, and graduating from advanced flight training at Napier Field, Loring was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Army Reserve. Loring was flying with the 22nd Fighter Squadron of the 9th Air Force's 36th Fighter Group out of Losey Army Airfield in Puerto Rico by December. His job was to wreck enemy submarines in the area of the Panama Canal and the Caribbean Sea. Loring learnt to fly a number of fighter planes such as P-40 Warhawks during this time, which was rad, but the Western Allies were getting ready to melt some Nazis in Europe in mid-1944 and Loring wanted to be a part of it. In April 1944, he got his chance. The 36th Fighter Group was sent to England to fly missions against the Germans. Now, in a Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, Loring was softening German-occupied Europe in preparation for the D-Day landings and Operation Overlord. In one mission over Coutances, France in June, Loring earned a Distinguished Flying Cross for annihilating 10 enemy armoured vehicles. But it wasn't all medals and smooth flying. On Christmas Eve 1944, by which point he had logged 55 combat missions, Loring's Thunderbolt was smacked by enemy flak during a strafing mission over Hotton, Belgium, and he went down. Captured by the Germans, he was taken to a garrison hospital in Hema, Germany, then sent to Frankfurt for interrogation. Loring spent the next six months as a POW. He was liberated just three days before the end of the war in Europe. Six months in captivity wasn't enough to break Loring's spirits, however. After the war, he stayed with the Army Air Corps and rose to the rank of captain. When the Korean War rolled around in 1950, Loring was busy sharpening his skills at the Air University in Alabama. He didn't get to fly in Korea until February 1952, initially serving in a personnel processing squadron with the 8th Fighter Bomber Wing of the 5th Air Force. In this position, Loring was largely responsible for supervising the training of other pilots. That was all well and good, but Loring was a bird of prey and couldn't sit around helping his chicks fly the nest for much longer. In July, he signed on as an operations officer in the 36th Fighter Bomber Squadron and climbed into the cockpit of an F-80 Shooting Star. 
Among its other roles, the 36th provided air support for ground units of the United Nations Command. Over the next five months, Loring carved through North Korean and Chinese PVA soldiers from the sky, logging a further 50 combat missions. Throughout the latter half of October and most of November 1952, a UN force composed of American, South Korean, Colombian and Ethiopian troops, supported by the US Air Force, fought to take Triangle Hill and Sniper Ridge in South Korea from a force of some 50,000 Chinese soldiers. This battle was codenamed Operation Showdown, or on the Chinese side, the Shangan Ling Campaign. Keeping our focus on Sniper Ridge, the UN forces and Chinese fought a bloody close quarters battle over this formation, with controls seesawing between the two forces throughout October and November. Right in the final days of Operation Showdown, Major Loring and the US 80th Fighter Bomber Squadron were overhead, and the UN forces fighting tooth and nail for Sniper Ridge, eating artillery barrage after artillery barrage, called for Loring's help. Preparing for a dive bombing run, Loring eats some artillery himself. His F-80 spewing smoke and taking a dive, Chinese flak whizzing past him into the clouds, Loring reflects upon his duty and life, and at around 1200 meters or 4000 feet, turns his aircraft 45 degrees to the left and pulls up in what seems to his wingmen a controlled maneuver. Now, however, what's left of the F-80's nose is pointing right at the Chinese artillery battery, the one that's putting the hurt on his comrades at Sniper Ridge. He's lost some control of his aircraft, but maybe there's still time to pull up, to retreat. At least, that's what Loring's wingmen are thinking. But that doesn't come to pass. Instead, they watch in awe as Loring nails his F-80 into the Chinese battery, obliterating it at the cost of his own life. In the end, while the UN forces may have lost Triangle Hill to the Chinese, they claimed victory at Sniper Ridge, and that may never have happened without Loring's sacrificing play. At the very least, many more UN lives would have been lost fighting for that artillery churned position. While nothing could ever express those soldiers' gratitude for Loring's sacrifice, the posthumous Medal of Honor awarded to Loring in May 1954 was a start. Presented by President Dwight D. Eisenhower, the citation read as follows. Loring deliberately altered his course and aimed his diving aircraft at active gun emplacements concentrated on a ridge northwest of the briefed target and elected to sacrifice his life by diving his aircraft directly into the midst of the enemy emplacements. His selfless and heroic action completely destroyed the enemy gun emplacement and eliminated a dangerous threat to United Nations ground forces. Major Loring's noble spirit, superlative courage, and conspicuous self-sacrifice in inflicting maximum damage on the enemy exemplified valor of the highest degree. Unfortunately, Loring's body was never recovered. A marker stands over a patch of earth without a body at Arlington National Cemetery, but he's honored in other ways too. Loring Air Force Base in the US bears his name as does a memorial park in Portland, Maine. At Loring's high school, his memory lives on in a display featuring replicas of his medals. According to Loring's father, Charles J. Loring Sr. Charlie was a stubborn man he said he would never be a prisoner again. He was the kind of man who kept his word about everything. Was this what was going through Loring's mind when he aimed his F-80 at the Chinese position? I guess we'll never know for sure. But what do you think? What leads a man to make a sacrificing play as that of Charles J. Loring Jr.? What do you think you would have done in Loring's situation? Back to basics. Had you heard of this war hero before today? Do you know anything about him that we didn't cover in this video? And lastly, would you like us to cover more airmen here on this channel? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. It's the 24th of May, 1969. Two hills, namely Hills 668 and 600 near the Benhead Special Forces Camp in South Vietnam, are a heavy point of contention between the North Vietnamese and a joint South Vietnamese American and Australian force. 
The 212th Company of the 1st Mobile Strike Force Battalion, led by Australian Chief Warrant Officer Keith Payne, advances from the splintered Smoking Hill 668 via a narrow, jungle-covered saddle toward Hill 600, held by the North Vietnamese Army, or NVA. At 14.20, a friendly artillery strike blows chunks of mud and jungle out of Hill 600. With that, Payne's company increases its pace over the battle-churned saddle, the smell of cordite and death in the air. These are the remains of the previous few days' carnage, but Payne has yet to make contact with the enemy this day. When he reaches the base of Hill 600 at 1700, that changes. The hill erupts with enemy machine gun fire, and accurate mortar fire makes a mess of the company. They've walked into an ambush. Payne can't help but think that they're about to be wiped off the map. We return to the Vietnam War to tell yet another tale of bravery, this time focusing on the actions of an Australian war machine and Victoria Cross recipient whose story deserves far more attention. Let's get right into it. Keith Payne was born in Queensland, Australia in 1933. He grew up with guns and his father fought in the Second World War. After school, he joined the regimental cadets where he improved his marksmanship and learned how to march, drill and fight. He then got an apprenticeship at a sawmill, a job he grew to despise. At 17, with his parents' approval, Payne tried to join the Australian Regular Army, but the army couldn't take him because of his apprenticeship. He needed to cancel that first. Payne went to his boss, who refused to let him go, so Payne, quote, squared up to him. Payne ended their tussle with a straight right that knocked his boss clean off his feet. Payne was summarily fired, which was exactly what he wanted. Why couldn't his boss have just done that from the start? Joining the army, Payne fought in the Korean War from April 1952 to March the following year. Returning from that conflict, he married a woman named Florence. About a decade later, in 1965, Payne served in Malaya and then returned to Australia to work as a field craft instructor. In February 1967, Payne served with the Pacific Islands Regiment in Papua New Guinea. Two years later, at the rank of Warrant Officer Class 2 and with plenty of experience under his belt, he went to Vietnam to serve as a military advisor under the Australian Army Training Team Vietnam or AATTV. By May 1969, Payne was at Ben Het Camp in Vietnam's Central Highlands, commanding the 212th Company of the 1st Mobile Strike Force Battalion, a component of Mobile Strike Force Command or Mike Force. In these units, American and Australian AATTV personnel led Vietnamese soldiers selected from the Civilian Irregular Defense Group, or CIDG. Payne's unit, along with the rest of the 1st Battalion, was soon choppered to the nearby Hill 668, which had been absolutely pummeled by North Vietnamese artillery to support the 5th Battalion of the 2nd Mobile Strike Force. Here, Payne met one Lieutenant James, the executive officer of the 1st Battalion. Immediately, Payne didn't trust the man, whom he described as fresh out of high school and who made the atrocious call to take the fight to Hill 600 over the narrow saddle connecting it to Hill 668. Despite James's rank, Payne shaped up and said, this is not a Mike Force job, it's too heavy for us. James listened, but didn't seem to care. On James's orders, the 212th company advanced over the smouldering, battle-worn saddle the next day, into absolute hell. As the sun set, glowing tracer rounds flashed through the jungle and hosed down Payne's men all around him. One of his comrades, Monty, takes a bullet to the face, his jaw hanging by a shred of skin. The noise is deafening, grenades and mortars exploding, men yelling, the ceaseless chatter of machine guns and rifles. Needing to do something, Payne borrows three grenades from his comrades and starts running and lobbing them up the hill filling the North Vietnamese with hot shrapnel. A B-40 rocket glides through the air in front of him in what seems like slow motion. It connects with a tree, and Payne goes ass overhead. He's in one piece, but clambering to his knees and then feet, he can't hear a thing. Men fire their weapons and scream with open mouths, but no sound comes out. Something hot and sticky clings to his head. He feels around and rips a piece of splintered tree from his brow. His M16 is a melted lump of plastic and metal. He picks up an M60 from the ground and fires it from the hip, the weapon bucking soundlessly. 
The machine gun chews like a hog through the ammunition belt and Payne dumps the M60 for a nearby M16. He covers his company while ordering them to retreat, the NVA pursuing them down the hill like an angry swarm of ants. Withdrawing himself, Payne bumps into his best mate, Lieutenant James, who's busy operating a radio. Back on Hill 600, there are two massive explosions, followed by the woof of gelled gasoline igniting. Payne watches in horror as a section of the hill withers in an apalm fire. Hose down the hill, Lieutenant James says into the handset. We're all off it. Payne snatches the handset from the lieutenant. Abort, abort, abort. Counterman that order. Some of Payne's men are still on that hill, wounded, dying. Alone, he charges back into the fray, fire flickering all around him, illuminating the corpses sewn through the jungle. Throughout the next three hours, Payne risked his life scouring Hill 600 and its surroundings for wounded and separated friendlies, guiding them to a makeshift defensive position and then heading back out to find more. Often, he had to crawl to avoid detection. I could hear isolated single shots, he later wrote. They were killing any remaining wounded they found. Of that, I had no doubt. At one point, a pair of NVA troops spotted Payne from higher ground. Luckily, they misjudged the slope of the hill, aiming their AKs too high. In Payne's words, they missed, I didn't. Fleeing to a different position after that encounter, he sparked a cigarette, sucked it down, said goodbye to his wife, and then resumed his perilous mission. At another point, he tracked down a group of 15 friendlies by following the phosphorus fungi they had disturbed while traversing the jungle. One of the men in this group, upon beholding a, quote, Filthy, stinking, wounded Keith Payne said, I don't know what the Australian equivalent of the Medal of Honor is, but you deserve it. As it turned out, Payne was awarded the equivalent medal, the Victoria Cross, for his actions that day and that night, during which he gathered about 40 stragglers from Hill 600, right under the noses of the North Vietnamese. The men made a grueling escape into the jungle and ultimately regrouped with the rest of the survivors. While waiting for a chopper to bring him and his wounded men to safety, Payne said that if he'd seen James, he would have freaking shot him. A portion of Payne's VC citation read, Warrant Officer Payne sustained and heroic personal efforts undoubtedly saved the lives of a large number of his indigenous soldiers and several of his fellow advisors. His repeated acts of exceptional bravery were an inspiration to all the Vietnamese, United States and Australian soldiers who served with him. Payne retired from the Australian Army in 1975 and became very active in the veteran community in Australia, especially as a counsellor for PTSD sufferers. He had a total of five sons with his wife, Flo, and published his memoir, No One Left Behind, our primary source for this video, in October 2021. Today, at 88 years of age, Keith Payne is a living legend from Australian history. But had you heard of this legend before today? Can you think of any other Australian war heroes from the Vietnam War? What about from any war? And lastly, do you know anything else about Keith Payne's life that we didn't cover in this video? Please feel free to share all that and more in the comment section below. It's early morning on the 9th of March 1966 in South Vietnam's A Shao Valley. 17 US Special Forces personnel and about 400 South Vietnamese of the Civilian Irregular Defense Group bunker down in a triangle-shaped Spec Ops camp. Among the men is Intelligence Sergeant Benny G. Adkins of Detachment A-102, 5th Special Forces Group, 1st Special Forces. Adkins anticipates an unrestrained assault by a numerically superior force of the People's Army of Vietnam, or PAVN, at any minute namely the 325th Division, a unit boasting some 2,000 men. A radio tent explodes to Adkins' right. Two more mortar shells take chunks out of the camp. Shrapnel rips through a nearby CIDG trooper who falls to the orange mud, eyes open. The sickly tang of blood invades Adkins' nose. Silhouettes move between the trees and elephant grass where muzzle flashes create fleeting constellations. Adkins sprints under heavy small arms fire for a nearby mortar pit. The Battle of Ao Shao is only just beginning. We return once again to Southeast Asia to tell a daring tale from the Vietnam War, this time featuring a Medal of Honor recipient whose utter disregard for his own safety will shock you, 
almost as much as his kill count. Benny Jean Adkins was born in Oklahoma on the 1st of February 1934 and was drafted into the US Army in 1956 at 22 years of age. He completed his training at Fort Bliss, Texas, then served in an administration role in Germany. After that, he served in the 2nd Infantry Division at Fort Benning, Georgia, and followed that up by attending Airborne School. Adkins, coming to embrace a military career, then volunteered for the US Special Forces, serving in the 5th Special Forces Group, Airborne, for a total of 13 years. In this unit, Adkins was deployed in Vietnam. By March 1966, Adkins was serving as an intelligence sergeant at Aoshao Special Forces Camp in South Vietnam's Aoshao Valley. On the 5th, a pair of PAVN defectors arrived at the camp and informed the defending American and South Vietnamese soldiers that the PAVN 325th Division was gearing up for an attack. On the 8th, the PAVN sent in their first wave, which the defenders repulsed. But that wasn't the end of it. The PAVN made a second, larger assault the following morning, and Adkins has just finished sighting his mortar. Adkins lets loose a mortar shell that erupts in the midst of several PAVN troops firing into the Spec Ops camp. They're blasted limb from limb before they can scream. In answer, a shell explodes right in front of Adkins. Hot shrapnel lacerates his flesh, but if Death thinks she's claiming Adkins this day, she's got another thing coming. Adkins fires a second mortar shell. Men die, and it continues like this as the sun ascends. Now, a friendly Douglas AC-47 Spooky circles the valley, raining hellfire on the PAVN. At 1300, a rocket whistles out of the tall grass and into the sky. With a terrible boom, the Spooky dives toward the jungle-covered mountains in a ball of smoke. The PAVN rally, subjecting the camp to an intense infantry assault. Ahead, several of Adkins' American comrades writhe in the mud, struck down by enemy bullets and mortar shells. Adkins leaves his mortar to the men at his side, then bolts from cover to the wounded men. Adkins senses a change in pressure as a bullet displaces the air beside his ear. Another sniper bullet grazes his shoulder. He hoists a wounded comrade from the mud and, fueled by adrenaline and sheer will, carries the man to the camp dispensary. With the first wounded man in relative safety, Adkins returns for the next, then the next. Adkins has just finished moving the last wounded men into the dispensary when a group of CIDG troops, supposed allies, adjust their fire. Now they're aiming at him. Spitting small arms fire back at the traitor CIDG troops, Adkins withdraws from the dispensary, hoping to draw the CIDG troops away from his wounded men. Parachutes descend from the sky, landing outside the camp perimeter. Their friendly resupply drops. If Adkins is going to continue this fight, which he fully intends to do, he's going to need more, and bigger, guns. From that afternoon until the early hours of the following morning, the Americans and loyal CIDG troops tried to retrieve a number of resupply drops delivered by friendly C-123s and CV-2s, but due to poor weather, most of the supplies landed outside the camp perimeter. As such, the men dug in anticipating the next PAVN assault. It came at 0500, and at this point, Adkins was the only defender operating a mortar, which he used to terrible effect. Once he'd loosed every single mortar shell available to him, ending enemy life after enemy life and sustaining dozens of injuries himself, he took up a recoilless rifle and pumped high caliber rounds into the advancing waves of PAVN troops. Despite Adkins absolutely chewing through the 325th Division ranks, it was clear to the defenders that, with no reinforcements coming their way, the Battle of Ashar was lost. As the PAVN closed their noose, Adkins and the other survivors destroyed the camp's communications equipment and classified documents, then retreated to a bunker which they dug through to escape the doomed camp and reach a helicopter extraction point. Adkins retreated with a wounded comrade upon his back and was soon informed that the last helicopter had departed, stranding him and a small group of men in the blood-soaked valley. Where others may have given up, Adkins led these men through a green hell for the next 48 hours, evading the PAVN and ultimately seeing his comrades to safety. 
They may never have escaped, however, if it weren't for an unexpected ally. In Adkins' words, this is what happened. The North Vietnamese soldiers were on us that night, and we were in a position where they had us surrounded, and we were all bloody and smelly and so forth. And throughout the night, a tiger stalked around us and the North Vietnamese soldiers became more frightened of the tiger than they were of us. They backed off and we were able to get away. It's estimated that Adkins killed, wait for it, between 135 and 175 enemy troops during the battle, accounting for far more than his fair share of the 800 casualties inflicted on the PAVN between the 9th and 10th of March in the Ashau Valley. He also sustained a total of 18 wounds which he totally disregarded as he pressed the fight against the PAVN. Interviewed later in life however, Adkins said, that was my job, that's what I was supposed to do and it's what any professional soldier would have done in that situation, so the body count was not important. For doing what any soldier would have done, Adkins received the Medal of Honor, but only 48 and a half years after the Battle of Ashau. President Obama presented the medal to Adkins in September 2014 after the US Army reconsidered the Distinguished Service Cross Adkins received back in 1967. Judging Adkins' heroics throughout those few days in March 1966, there was just no way the Army could deny the 80-year-old veteran this upgrade. In Obama's words, normally this medal must be awarded within a few years of the action, but sometimes even the most extraordinary stories can get lost in the fog of war. After retiring from the army back in 1978, Adkins went to university and earned two master's degrees, then started up his own accounting company and taught at university as well. In 2017, he scored an honorary doctorate of law. In March 2020, this American war hero contracted COVID-19. On the 27th of April, it took his life. He was 86 years old. While the Americans and South Vietnamese, attacked by a numerically superior PAVN force, lost the Battle of Ashau, it's possible that none of them would have survived without the bravery of Sergeant Benny Jean Adkins. So had you heard of him before today? What about the battle in which he earned his Medal of Honor? Do you think the 135 to 175 kills is an exaggeration, or was Adkins that much of a war machine? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. It's night on the 3rd of February 1951. Company A of the 19th Infantry Regiment, 24th Division of the US 8th Army, occupies an outpost upon a ridge south of Seoul in Korea. One Master Sergeant Adams maintains a position about 180 meters or 590 feet ahead of Company A, in command of a platoon. The 8th Army, a 94,000 man strong unit composed of various American, British, South Korean, Turkish and Colombian United Nations units, has been driving some 50,000 North Korean and Chinese troops back to Seoul and the Han River since the 25th of January and the offensive seems to be working. Shortly after the clock strikes 2300, Adam spots movement below and soon an overwhelming force of enemy soldiers crashes like a wave against the outpost. The other American companies protecting Company A's flanks are driven back under heavy machine gun fire and mortar fire. Company A fires on the advancing enemy troops from its higher position on the ridge, but there's too many, and Company A is quickly surrounded, with Adams and his platoon isolated even further ahead. At around 0100, some 250 enemy soldiers collapse on Adams, but this war machine isn't about to back down. Stanley Taylor Adams was born in Kansas on the 9th of May, 1922. We know little about his early life, except that he joined the US Army in 1942, not too long after the US entered the Second World War. We only know that Adams fought in North Africa and Italy, where he was wounded. After the Japanese surrendered, Adams served in Japan as part of the Allied occupation, which lasted from 1945 to 1952 and involved almost a million Allied soldiers. In July 1950, before the occupation of Japan came to an end, Adams was deployed to Korea in a company of the US 8th Army. In November and December that year, North Korean and Chinese PVA forces once again drove the United Nations forces south through North Korea after the infamous battles of Chongchun River and Chosun Reservoir, the latter being the battle in which Lloyd L. Burke earned his Medal of Honor. At this point, after losing so much ground, the UN was seriously reconsidering its involvement in the Korean War. 
Retreating to Seoul, the 8th Army fought the North Koreans and Chinese in the city between New Year's Eve and the 7th of January 1951 and were ultimately driven out and southward over the Han River. The 8th Army, by late January, was sick of retreating and launched a counteroffensive known as Operation Thunderbolt, or for the Chinese, the defensive battle of the Han Southern Bank. The 8th Army's general plan was to drive the enemy back to the Han River and crush them. Adams' platoon was part of this larger offensive, operating as a forward element of Company A. This is how it went down. Muzzle flashes light up the winter night. A mortar shell explodes just meters from Master Sergeant Adams, who keeps his cool and directs his platoon's fire against the ascending enemy troops. Enemy machine gun fire cuts a man down to Adams' left. A mortar shell shreds two more. Adams knows he can do some decent damage by holding onto his position with tooth and nail, but even more if he can withdraw his platoon to the main company position. Under intense enemy fire, the platoon fights its way back along the ridge, the survivors regrouping with the bulk of Company A. Still, the Americans are surrounded by the enemy. It's only a matter of time before the outpost is overrun. This is time for big plays, and Adams knows it. The master sergeant fixes his bayonet and gathers 13 of his most fearsome men, ordering them to fix their bayonets too. At this point, the North Korean and Chinese force has been cut down to 150. Steel flashing, eyes black with primal fury, Adams charges headfirst into the unsuspecting enemy. Within 45 meters or 150 feet of the enemy, a bullet disappears into Adams' leg. He crashes to the ground. His 13 bayonet-wielding warriors hesitate, but Adams does not. Ignoring his wound, he jumps to his feet and continues across the bullet and shrapnel-swept battlefield. A grenade bursts in front of him. Again, he goes down, and again, he rises. The next grenade bounces off quite literally Adams' chest, and the blast knocks him once again from his feet. But again, he gets straight back up. This happens twice more before Adams finally crosses blades with the enemy. With an enraged Adams in their midst, the North Korean and Chinese troops don't know what to do with themselves. He tears through their ranks with his bayonet and his men follow, a force of 14 against 150, skewering, gutting and rifle butt bludgeoning the stupefied North Koreans and Chinese. The Americans are dogs in a chicken coop, and after an hour of absolute carnage, 50 enemy troops have passed into the forever sleep. The rest of them flee with their balls sucked up into their bellies. For his actions on the 3rd and 4th of February, Adams received a Medal of Honor presented by President Harry S. Truman in the White House on the 5th of July, 1951. A section of the citation reads as follows. Shouting orders, he charged the enemy positions and engaged them in hand-to-hand -hand combat where man after man fell before his terrific onslaught with bayonet and rifle butt. After nearly an hour of vicious action, Adams and his comrades routed the fanatical foe, killing over 50 and forcing the remainder to withdraw. Adams' superb leadership, incredible courage, and consummate devotion to duty so inspired his comrades that the enemy attack was completely thwarted, saving his battalion from possible disaster. His sustained personal bravery and indomitable fighting spirit against overwhelming odds reflect the utmost glory upon himself and uphold the finest traditions of the infantry and military service. According to author Edward F. Murphy in his 1992 book, Korean War Heroes, the tenacity of the Chinese and North Korean soldiers forced the men of the 8th Army to battle them at close quarters reminiscent of the Civil War. The only way to remove the enemy from their hilltop positions was to dig them out. Men like Sergeant Adams knew this and effectively used the almost obsolete bayonet to accomplish their missions. Due to acts of utmost bravery like that of Master Sergeant Adams, the 8th Army achieved victory in Operation Thunderbolt, inflicting some 29,000 casualties on the North Koreans and Chinese and forcing the survivors to limp to the east, away from Seoul. It was a crucial battle in the so-called Fourth Phase Campaign of the Korean War, and Adams survived the battle as well as the rest of this bloody war. Not long after receiving his medal, Adams was promoted to second lieutenant. It's unclear what he got up to after that, 
but we know he retired from the military as Lieutenant Colonel in 1970, almost 20 years after Operation Thunderbolt. After working in Alaska for the Internal Revenue Service for a time, Adams was unfortunately diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. He lived at the Oregon Veterans Home from then on and perished there in 1999 at 76 years of age. Adams' third wife, Jean, whom he married in 1981, donated Adams' Medal of Honor to the Veterans Home where it was put on display in the entryway. Had you heard of Stanley Taylor Adams before today? What about Operation Thunderbolt? Why do you think the bayonet charge succeeded there? Why couldn't bullets do the job? Do you think Adams and his 13 men really skew 50 North Korean and Chinese soldiers? And lastly, can you think of any other crazy stories from the Korean War? Please let us know all that and more in the comment section below. It's night time on the 29th of November 1950. Heavy snowfall buries a Marine Corps headquarters at Hagori Ri near the Chosun Reservoir in North Korea, where it's presently minus 25 degrees Fahrenheit. The cold benumbs US Major Reginald R. Meyer's face, but not his spirit. Meyer's CO has instructed him to seize control of a steep, windswept feature known as East Hill, occupied by some 4,000 troops of the Chinese People's Volunteer Army, or PVA. After days of intense fighting, the American forces around the Chosin Reservoir are depleted and tired as hell. Available to Myers is only a ragtag force of 250 Marine Corps and Army personnel, including many non-combatants like cooks, bakers, and candlestick makers. But Myers doesn't let that interfere with his orders. Snow and machine gun fire spits down on the hillside. Artillery shells tear the leafless, sodden trees clinging to the hillside to splinters. Myers grits his teeth and begins the climb of his life. We return to the Korean War to tell the tale of one of America's greatest career soldiers and Medal of Honor recipients. Reginald Rodney Myers was born in Boise, Idaho on the 26th of November 1919. After completing high school in Salt Lake City, Utah, he went to the University of Idaho and graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering in 1941. While at the university, he was a cadet in the Reserve Officers Training Corps. In September 1941, he left the reserves to become a second lieutenant in the US Marine Corps just in time for the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor and America's entry into the Second World War. Myers completed the Marine Officers Basic School at Philadelphia Navy Yard, then became a company commander in San Diego. In June the following year, Myers was aboard the USS New Orleans serving in the Marine Detachment. He fought the Japanese in the Pacific Ocean, notably in Guadalcanal and the Solomon Island campaigns. By 1943, Myers was a captain on board the USS Minneapolis in charge of his own Marine detachment. In January 1945, Myers reached the rank of Major. Now, the war wasn't looking so good for the Japanese and the Allies were closing in on their home islands. In June, Major Myers fought in the infamous Battle of Okinawa serving with the 5th Marines of the 1st Marine Division. He then participated in the US landing and occupation of northern China. It was now safe to say that Myers was a man of war and damn good at it too. Returning to the US after the Japanese surrender, he served at various military bases until May 1950 when the war in Korea called his name. Serving as an executive offer in the 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines, 1st Marine Division, he earned a bronze star for risking his life to rescue two wounded comrades during the Incheon landings and then, days later, a gold star. In November 1950, Myers found himself neck deep in the snow in the infamously bloody Battle of Chosun Reservoir. Here, just a month after the PVA entered the Korean War, some 120,000 troops of the PVA's 9th Army Group encircled a United Nations force composed of some 30,000 American, British, and South Korean troops at the Chosun Reservoir in the mountains of Chunchin County. Hagaru Ri was a vital supply base, the site of an under construction airfield, and the HQ of the 1st Marine Division. It was vital to UN operations in the area of the Chosun Reservoir, yet it wasn't as heavily defended as some of the other positions surrounding the immense water body. The 58th Division of the PVA closed on Hagaru Ri on the 28th of November 
and the understrength UN base made even non-combatants take up arms to stave off the Chinese. Among the various offensives made by the UN forces to break the 58th Division's encirclement of Hogaruri was the offensive led by Major Myers against as many as 4,000 Chinese troops heavily entrenched upon East Hill and causing all sorts of chaos with their artillery. Speaking of artillery, a shell flattens trees and sends up a geyser of snow at the base of East Hill. Myers' ragtag team of marines, soldiers and non-combatants huddles among the rocks and trees. Men shiver more from fear than the sub-zero temperature. The last thing they want to do is go up that blasted hill, but Myers won't have it. If they stay down here, they'll get torn to shreds and the Chinese will take the base. Firing his pistol into the air, Myers quite literally boots his men up the hillside. Slowly, they emerge from their foxholes in the snow and edge their way up the hill. The chatter of machine gun fire echoes between the frozen summits. Myers spearheads the climb, stopping only to give his men a kick forward or to direct mortar and artillery fire against the Chinese on the crest. It goes on like this for hours, night turning to day, but Myers doesn't falter nor tire. His men carry the wounded down the hill in stretches and then never come back, claimed by Chinese artillery or too afraid to push upward through hell. But some survive. Some press on, and after a grueling 14 hours, a surviving force of 50 men breach the crest and engage the Chinese in close quarters. After reaching the top of East Hill and engaging the Chinese for a time, Myers withdrew his men to a defensible position and held out while Marine Captain Carl Sitter clambered his way to the crest of the hill with fresh reinforcements and knocked the remaining Chinese back down the far side. Leading the initial attack, Myers lost 170 men, but managed to kill 600 Chinese and wound a further 500. His Medal of Honor citation speaks for the bravery and leadership he exhibited that day. Severely handicapped by a lack of trained personnel and experienced leaders, he persisted in constantly exposing himself to intense, accurate and sustained hostile fire in order to direct and supervise the employment of his men and to encourage and spur them on in pressing the attack. Inexorably moving forward up the steep, snow-covered slope with his depleted group in the face of apparently insurmountable odds, his resolute spirit of self-sacrifice and unfaltering devotion to duty enhance and sustain the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. While both sides claimed victory in the larger Battle of Chosen Reservoir, a 17-day bender of violence exacerbated by dismal supplies and atrocious weather conditions, Maya's actions were no less integral to the defense of Hagaruri, where UN forces had all but made the PVA 58th Division extinct by the 1st of December. Myers was well deserving of his Medal of Honor, and Captain Sitter was awarded one too. Myers survived the battle and continued to fight in Korea up until April 1951, when he was wounded in action. After that, Myers returned to the US, recovered and served at the Marine Basic School at Quantico. He then served as an inspector instructor for the Marine Reserves in Washington DC, after which he went back to Quantico and worked in the senior school. From 1958 to 1962, Myers worked at the US Embassy in London, achieving his final rank of colonel during this time. Myers furthered his military career right through to 1967 when he retired from active service. He also earned his masters at George Washington University. Colonel Myers died in 2005 at 85 years of age and was buried at the US Military Cemetery in Arlington, Virginia. In an interview with the Congressional Medal of Honor Society, Myers said, I always wanted to be a Marine. My mother cried and my father cried, cried because I was joining the Marine Corps. They said, you're gonna die, you're gonna die. I said, nah, not me, not me. As it turned out, Myers was right about that. He closed that same interview with the following statement. Freedom is not free. Freedom is something you have to earn. But we'd love to know what you think. Had you heard of Reginald Rodney Myers before today? What about the Battle of Chosen Reservoir? Are there any other heroes of the Korean War you'd like us to cover on this channel? If so, who? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comments section below. It's the 28th of October 1951 in Chongdong, Korea. 
Company G of the 5th Cavalry Regiment, US 1st Cavalry Division is attempting to cross the Yokok Chon River. Again and again, they're repulsed by a force of the Chinese People's Volunteer Army, or PVA, positioned in a series of wooden fronted bunks on Hill 200. To the rear of the company, Lieutenant Lloyd L. Burke watches his men assault the base of the hill, and it's killing him. I can't leave my guys up there without trying to do something, he says, and then makes a dash for his men. The company's beat. They huddle in the muddy foxholes, fixing him with the thousand yard stare. Burke knows these men have seen too much fighting, too much death. He hauls a 57mm recoilless anti-tank rifle up to his shoulder and aims it at the nearest Chinese bunker. He isn't about to let his guys die here today. Lloyd Leslie Burke was born in Ticknor, Arkansas on the 29th of September 1924. He went to Henderson State College in Arkansas and dropped out in 1943, a man of 18 years, to join the US Army and fight in the Second World War. We know Burke served for about two years in Italy during the war and gained the nickname Scooter during it, but unfortunately, we know little else about Burke's deployment. Returning home after the war, he joined the US Army Reserve Officers Training Corps, graduating in 1950. Burke then accepted a commission as a second lieutenant of infantry. Five months later, he was in Korea fighting against North Korea and the PVA. Prior to the events of the 28th of October 1951, Burke earned a Distinguished Service Cross and two Purple Hearts for his outstanding performance while leading his company. And that brings us back to the muddy, bloody base of Hill 200. There's a deafening crack accompanied by a cloud of smoke. A shell from Burke's recoilless rifle rips through the front of a Chinese bunker, sending splinters and mud into the air. Burke fires a further two shots up the hill and then tosses the massive gun aside. Grenades bounce down the hill, spitting shrapnel at Company G. Burke slings his M1 Garand into his hands and aims at the source of the grenades, a Chinese trench. They pop up like the moles in a game of whack-a-mole, pitching their grenades and then taking cover. But their game won't last long. As each PVA troop shows his head, Burke puts a bullet in it, quickly emptying his eight round clip. Despite this, more grenades come. If Burke wants to deal some real damage, he has to get up there. Tossing his next weapon aside and readying a grenade, Burke charges up the hill to the enemy trench. Bullets whiz past his head, but none of them find home. He draws his pistol and jumps into the trench. One shot and a bullet sinks into a PVA soldier's third eye. Another five shots and five more Chinese get doses of lead to the brain. Burke finally lobs his grenade, taking a chunk out of the trench ahead of him. The enemy is well aware of him now. Burke clambers up the side of the trench and takes cover against the side of the hill. From this angle, the Chinese can reach him with grenades, but most of their grenades just tumble down on the steep slope. The few that are on target, Burke catches mid-air and lobs them back at the Chinese. He then scales the hillside and comes to a gully. Following the gully, he finds a Korean burial mound that overlooks the main Chinese trench. Here, the Chinese are almost relaxed. Behind the forward trenches, they can lob grenades and loose mortars at their leisure. Some of them just sit around, having a good laugh and a chat. This is where Burke can do some real damage. Following the gully back down Hill 200, Burke reconvenes with Company G and one Sergeant Arthur Foster. Get him ready to attack when I give you the signal, he says to Foster. Then he heaves a Browning 1919 machine gun up from the ground, takes three 250 round ammo boxes and descends the hill once more. Atop the Korean burial mound, overlooking the Chinese trench, Burke mounts the Browning and rains hell on the unsuspecting Chinese. They go down in scores, shouting and running about like headless chickens while Burke cuts them up. The Browning comes to a sudden halt, jammed. As Burke's trying to clear the gun, grenades burst to his left and right. One fills his hand with shrapnel. He doesn't feel it. The gun clears. Burke chews through the man who threw the grenade at him. Now, Foster and a group from Company G are at Burke's side, and the remaining Chinese troops are scurrying off through the trenches. Burke tears the smoking hot browning from its tripod, wraps the ammo belt around his chest, and walks into the trench, carving through the retreating Chinese and leading his men to victory. On Hill 200 in Korea, 
Lieutenant Burke single-handedly slew 100 Chinese soldiers and destroyed three machine gun nests and two mortar emplacements. Accounting for more than his fair share of the 250 Chinese killed there on that day in October. This figure comes from Burke's Medal of Honor citation. A portion of the citation read as follows. Burke set up his gun and poured a crippling fire into the ranks of the enemy, killing approximately 75. Cradling the weapon in his arms, he then led his men forward, killing some 25 more of his retreating enemy and securing the objective. His heroic action and daring exploits inspired his small force of 35 troops. His unflinching courage and outstanding leadership reflect the highest credit upon himself, the infantry, and the US Army. When Burke had run out of Browning ammunition, he took out his pistol and continued clearing out the Chinese bunkers, then went on to survive the day and the war. But fighting in just two major wars wouldn't do for this career soldier. When US forces entered the Vietnam War, Burke signed up, commanding the 2nd Battalion of the US 16th Infantry Regiment as a Lieutenant Colonel. In July 1965, near Bien Hoa in the Dong Rai province, some friendly engineers had bulldozed an area near a US base camp and uncovered a Viet Cong sniper. The sniper fled and Burke climbed into a helicopter to give chase. The sniper must have been a pretty good shot. He shot Burke's chopper out of the sky and Burke was badly wounded in the crash. He later recounted the event in a letter to the commanding general of the 1st Infantry Division. The section of the letter read, A rundown of my wounds reveals a hole in my right ankle, a hole in my left foot, a chunk of meat out of the left calf about as big as your fist and a compound fracture of the left tibia. Moving up the body, my left index finger is gone, a hole in my right cheek about as big as your thumb, and it goes on like that. Another lieutenant colonel, one Richard P. Clark, wrote about the event in his diary. I've known Scooter Burke for a long time, and he's just crazy enough to get himself killed. It's a real good thing he got wounded and is being evacuated because he takes such needless risks that sooner or later he would have been killed. He had no business being where he was and doing what he was doing when he got wounded. That's lieutenant's work. After Vietnam, Burke worked as the US Army liaison to the US House of Representatives and then retired from the military in 1978 at the rank of colonel. Burke also helped establish the Korean War Veterans Memorial and joined a number of military clubs, even serving as the president of the Medal of Honor Society for a time. He died in his sleep at 74 years of age in his home in Arkansas. We'll close with an excerpt from a special tribute to Burke presented on Scripps Howard News Service in July 1999 by one John Lang. He killed people. He was just about the best at that when he had to be. In one day in the Korean War, he, single-handedly to save his men, slew a hundred foe. He was honored for this and for other actions as were Alvin York in World War I and Audie Murphy in World War II. He was that rarest of soldiers. But we'd love to know what you think. Had you heard of Lloyd Leslie Burke before today? On a scale of one to 10, how insane were his actions upon Hill 200? And lastly, do you know any other lesser known stories like Scooter Burke's? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. The year is 1951. After two days of vicious combat, two platoons of Captain Lewis Millet's Easy Company of the US 27th Infantry Regiment, or Wolfhounds, find themselves once more at the base of Hill 180, near Anyang, Korea. Millet hangs slightly back with 3rd platoon, watching Chinese rifle and anti-tank fire rip the hill to shreds, scarcely missing the forwardly positioned 1st platoon. The popping of small arms cartridges is endless, broken only by the roars of larger shells and fighting dying soldiers. Millet doesn't want the good men of the 1st platoon to join the dead. Despite the physical and mental exhaustion brought about by two days of intense close quarters fighting, he steals himself. Turning to the third platoon, he says, fix bayonets boys, we're going up that hill. Captain Lewis Millet, not only a hero of the Korean War, but the Second World War and Vietnam War too. Let's get stuck into it. Lewis Lee Millet was born in Maine in 1920, but grew up in Massachusetts. War was in his blood. His grandfather fought in the American Civil War and his uncle in World War I. 
At 18 years of age, he joined the National Guard. The following year, the Germans invaded Poland, dragging the world into yet another catastrophe. Millet signed up for the US Army Air Corps, as it would any sane man, seeing what the Germans were doing in Europe infuriated him. Why was the US doing nothing? Why wasn't America stepping up to the plate to take that monster down? Millet deserted the US Army and hitchhiked to Canada where he signed up for the Canadian Army. Before he could get really stuck into the action though, Imperial Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and roused the sleeping giant and he went back to the Yanks. Finally, he would have his war. Assigned to an armored division, Millet fought as an anti-tank gunner in North Africa, decimating the Vichy French in Operation Torch in November 1942. Among his many heroic deeds, he was waging war when a nearby friendly half-track got hit and caught fire. If that wasn't bad enough, the vehicle was filled with ammunition and was about to blow up in the midst of Millet and his fellow soldiers. Millet, a real-life action hero, sped the half-track away from his comrades and leapt out of the vehicle just before it exploded. For this, he was awarded the Silver Star. He also shot down a freaking German fighter plane with a half-track mounted machine gun. By September 1943, Millet was in Italy fighting the Germans and Italians. Here, the US Army caught wind of Millet's little desertion stunt and made him cough up $52 and let go of his leave privileges. He took it in stride, and he was even promoted a few weeks later. It seems Millet was too good to ignore. It's unclear what Millet got up to after Italy, but when World War II came to an end, he went home and attended college for a while before the US stuck its finger in the sanguinary pie that was the Korean War. In December 1950, Millet was an observer in a Stinson L5 Sentinel when he observed a US fighter bomber crash into the earth. Millet's pilot brought the L5 down and the men found that the fighter bomber's pilot had survived the impact. Rather than just leaving the pilot there, Millet gave the pilot his seat in the L5 and then hid out somewhere near the crash site for the whole day until someone came and rescued him. See, you don't have to kill enemy soldiers to be a legend. But don't worry, Millet did plenty of killing too. In Operation Thunderbolt in February the following year, the Wolfhounds were spearheading a US offensive against the Chinese and North Koreans. As we said, Millet's company was a part of the Wolfhounds, and those men were lucky to have a Terminator such as him as their captain. Taking Hill 180 was a critical objective. On the 5th of February, Millet's Easy Company advanced through a rice paddy field and began a grueling advance up the hill, crossing bayonets with the Chinese. This went on for two days, after which the company found itself back at the bottom of the hill under heavy fire. That was when Millet fixed his bayonet and wrought hell on his enemies. Under a hail of enemy fire, 3rd platoon advanced to 1st platoon's position. With his company whole again, Millet grits his teeth and marches straight up the hill. He cares little about his own safety, only the objective. He cares little about bullets, only his bayonet, which he uses to gut the next Chinese soldier unlucky enough to get in his way. Stepping over the soldier's corpse, Millet rips the pin from a grenade and lobs it. Guts and mud erupt into the air. Millet rallies his men onwards and upwards. Galvanized by their captain's bravery and taking a leaf from his book, they charge with their bayonets, skewering enemy soldiers into the face of the mountain. Another falls to Millet's blade, and the whole thing devolves into a melee more suited to the sword and spear wars of the Middle Ages. Millet cracks a skull with the butt of his rifle, pitches a grenade that turns a Chinese machine gun position into a smoking crater. An enemy grenade lands by his side, explodes. Leg filled with shrapnel, Millet fights on, refusing evacuation right up until his men cut down the last Chinese soldier and claim what will henceforth be known as Bayonet Hill. On that bloody day in history, Millet's company executed what would come to be known as the most complete bayonet charge by American troops since the Battle of Cold Harbor in the American Civil War. Of the 50 Chinese troops the company unstrung that day, 20 fell to bayonets. For his actions, 
Millet was awarded the Medal of Honor, which President Truman presented to him later that year. The citation reads as follows, Captain Millet placed himself at the head of the two platoons and, with fixed bayonet, led the assault up the fire-swept hill. He bayoneted two enemy soldiers and boldly continued on, throwing grenades, clubbing and bayoneting the enemy while urging his men forward. Despite vicious opposing fire, the whirlwind hand-to-hand -hand assault carried to the crest of the hill. His dauntless leadership and personal courage so inspired his men that they stormed into the hostile position and used their bayonets with such lethal effect that the enemy fled in wild disorder. The superb leadership, conspicuous courage, and consummate devotion to duty demonstrated by Captain Millet were directly responsible for the successful accomplishment of a hazardous mission. But Millet's story doesn't end there. After the Korean War came to an end in 1953, he went to Ranger School in Fort Benning to hone his preferred art form, war. A couple of years later, America stuck its finger in yet another pie. In the end, it probably wished it hadn't. But Millet seized the opportunity nonetheless, serving as an officer, advisor, and long-range reconnaissance commander in the Vietnam War. For a time, he was part of the so-called Phoenix program spearheaded by the CIA. Working with fellow Americans, Aussies, and the South Vietnamese, the operatives of the Phoenix program sought to take down the Viet Cong via infiltration, assassination, capture, interrogation, and torture. It was an effective yet controversial program, to say the least. In 1973, Millet retired from the military at the rank of colonel. Throughout his career, he received too many awards to list, both from the US military and foreign militaries. Taking what he'd learnt, Millet worked as a deputy sheriff in Tennessee for a while. Then he moved to California, where he died of heart failure just shy of his 89th birthday in 2009. If you live in the States and want to see him up close, there's a life-size diorama of his bayonet charge uphill 180 on display at the US Army Infantry Museum at Fort Benning, Georgia. As always, we're eager to know what you think. Had you heard of Captain Louis Millet before today? What about Bayonet Hill? Lastly, can you think of any other crazy bayonet charges like this one? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. It's June 1952. A United States Army battalion leave under the cover of night for the mountains of South Korea, somewhere near the Minari Gol, where a force of the Chinese People's Volunteer Army or PVA are operating. The battalion's mission is to capture some Chinese soldiers for interrogation, but one platoon is tasked with assaulting a specific enemy position, a barren trench-woven hill known by the US Armed Forces in Korea as Hill 499. A 2 meter 110 kilogram Mormon field medic by the name of Bleak volunteers to go with the platoon, and the unit will be glad that he did. The Chinese, not so much. We delve into the story of David Bruce Bleak, a beast of a man and an American hero. As is customary, let's begin at the start, when Bleak climbed down Jack's beanstalk and entered our fragile world. David Bruce Bleak was born into a farming community in Idaho Falls on the 27th of February 1932, and was the seventh of his parents' nine children, and judging by the size of David, his mother has well and truly earned our sympathy. Bleak made it to high school before he dropped out of school, opting to work as a farmer, rancher, and then railroad worker instead. But he ultimately got bored and massive. When he was old enough, Bleak joined the army, beginning his basic training in November 1950 at just 18 years of age at Fort Riley in Kansas. Putting Hodor to shame with his physicality, Bleak was chosen to become a medic. You might think this was a waste of his might, but Bleak sums it up well. The medic has to be able to pack the wounded soldiers out, and he looked like a guy who was strong enough to do it. They were right, it was a good call. When he completed his medical training, he was attached to the 2nd Battalion of the 223rd Infantry Regiment of the US Army's 40th Infantry Division. It was January 1952 and the Korean War had been raging for a while now, so Korea was where they sent him. It's unclear what Bleak got up to in the first several months of his deployment, 
but he was quickly promoted to sergeant, and on the 14th of June, he was clambering up Hill 499 at the rear of a 20-man US platoon, eager to save some lives. What he might not have known is that he would soon be ending some lives too. Soon after the 20-man platoon begins climbing Hill 499, their early morning exercise is spoiled by a volley of Chinese automatic weapons fire. The American soldiers higher up the hill drop to the earth, either hit or scrambling for cover. Higher up the hill is a network of Chinese trenches, from which the PVA troops now fire at will. Sergeant Bleak keeps his cool though, rushing forward to stabilize his wounded comrades. Men's screams are drowned out by exploding cartridges. Blood dribbles over Bleak's massive hands. But it's not his own. With a dexterity unbefitting to his stature, he staunches the bleeding, then lumbers up the hill with the rest of the unit, which is making at least some ground. Like meerkats from their burrows, several Chinese soldiers peep out of a nearby trench and gun down a US soldier right next to Bleak. He's stayed relatively cool to this point, but now a rage swells through Bleak, and all he sees is red. Roaring, he launches his full 110 kilos into the Chinese trench, tackling one Chinese soldier to the ground and then wringing his neck like a roll of bubble wrap, pops and all. Before another Chinese soldier can react, Bleak shuts his hand on the soldier's throat, turning his windpipe into a fleshy ribbon. The next man, Bleak straight up skewers with his combat knife. Having opened the way for the platoon, Bleak returns to tend to the wounded, and as he's doing so, a hand grenade literally bounces off the top of his helmet, landing on the ground next to him and the friendly soldier beside him. Thinking fast, Bleak spear tackles the soldier, then throws his body over the soldier protecting him from what they would quickly realize was a concussion grenade. Due to Bleak's fearless hulk charge, the platoon soon makes it to the top of the hill, capturing a key feature of the surrounding terrain. As Bleak is moving back down the hill, several Chinese soldiers, whom the platoon had unfortunately missed, open fire from a nearby trench. Three men go down, and as Bleak tries to run to their aid, his leg explodes with pain, a bullet having sunken into it. But this beast won't go down so easily. After tending to the man's wounds, as well as his own, he lifts one of the more wounded men and begins carrying him down the hill to safety. At this point, two more enemy soldiers appear. Sighing, Bleak puts his friend down, then, once again, rushes the Chinese. Reaching before they can react, he takes one of their heads in each of his hands, then claps their heads together, ending both of their lives. Picking up his wounded comrade, Bleak descends the remainder of Hill 499, having well and truly saved the day. After the savagery which took place on Hill 499, Bleak spent some time in hospital where he learned that he'd suffered nerve damage as a result of his leg wound. Less than a month later, he was back in the thick of it, saving lives, but he didn't stay in Korea for all that long. He served in Japan next, and a few months after the Korean War came to an end, he received a Medal of Honor from US President Dwight D. Eisenhower, then retired at the rank of Staff Sergeant. The citation is great. In part, it read, Forging up the rugged slope, the group was subjected to intense fire and suffered several casualties. After administering to the wounded, he continued to advance with the patrol, nearing the military crest of the hill. While attempting to cross the fire-swept area to attend to the wounded, Sergeant Bleak came under hostile fire from a group of the enemy concealed in a trench. Entering the trench, he closed with the enemy, killed two with his bare hands, and a third with his trench knife. Later, he was struck by a hostile bullet, but despite the wound, he undertook to evacuate a wounded comrade. As he moved down the hill with his heavy burden, he was attacked by two enemy soldiers with fixed bayonets. Closing with the aggressors, he grabbed them and smacked their heads together. Bleak's Medal of Honor lives at the Idaho Military History Museum, but it was one of the many awards he received, with the Purple Heart and the Republic of Korea Presidential Unit Citation being among the others. After leaving the military, Bleak moved to Wyoming and took up a range of different jobs. He drove trucks, cut meat, and even returned to ranch work for a bit. An obvious stud, 
Bleak got married and had a litter of kids. In his mid-30s, Bleak moved back to Idaho and ran a dairy farm for a decade, then worked in an engineering lab as a janitor and technician in the 90s. In March 2006, having suffered from emphysema and a few other diseases and injuries for some time, Bleak's life came to an end. It has been said that he was a humble man who never spoke to his children about the war, despite Bleak being one of the all-time greatest war heroes. But as always, we want to know what you think. Had you heard of David Bruce Bleak before today? Do you know of any similar tales of bravery from the Korean War? It's the middle of the night between the 22nd and 23rd of April 1951 and all is not silent. Around 900 troops of the Filipino 10th Battalion Combat Team are taking the full brunt of a Chinese force at least 10,000 troops strong. A Filipino first lieutenant by the name of Jose M. Artiaga has, so far, kept a hold of his platoon's position upon the strategic Yultong Hill in South Korea, but the Chinese People's Volunteer Army is swallowing the hill like a rising blood red tide. Atiaga shreds his throat, screaming commands over the ceaseless prattling of machine gun fire and exploding of mortar and artillery shells. The unit is completely surrounded, isolated, and if it were not for Atiaga raising their spirits and constantly adapting their defense as more and more of them die, the men may have given up long ago. A call for help has gone out, but the higher-ups have pretty much left them for dead. Atiaga is standing knee-deep in the dead when a bullet rips through his flesh, but he has not yet joined the fallen, and one Filipino captain, in charge of the company to which Atiaga belongs, refuses to abandon his comrade to the mercy of the Chinese. But will he get to the hill in time? featuring two heroic individuals who earned their place in history in the very same battle on the very same night. We've named Artiaga, but the second man, the Filipino captain, is the war hero Conrado Yap, arguably the more famous among the two. Still, we don't know all that much about either men outside of their service in the Korean War, so we'll be getting stuck back into the action relatively soon. As a side note, we've covered the Battle of Yultong on our brother channel, The Front, and while we did talk about Yap a little in that video, he was by no means its focus. With Artiaga, all that we know is that he was born in the Philippines at least a couple of decades before the Korean War in the early 1950s. It's possible he lived in the city of San Juan, too. Conrado Damlao Yap, on the other hand, was born in the municipality of Candelaria in the Philippines in 1921 and graduated from the Philippine Military Academy in either 1942 or 1943. Some sources also state that Yap was captured during the Battle of Bataan. He obviously survived the Japanese and then the rest of World War II. Overall, it's unclear if Artiaga and Yap were good friends but they seem to have been happy enough in each other's presence in this image. They were both part of the 10th Battalion Combat Team, or 10th BCT, which was deployed in Korea under the Philippine Expeditionary Force to Korea, or PEFTOC. In short, the Filipinos fought alongside the soldiers of other belligerent United Nations countries, such as the United States, against North Korea and its allies, such as China and its People's Volunteer Army, or PVA. The Battle of Yultong was a part of the Chinese Spring Offensive. The 10th BCT, attached to the United States 3rd Infantry Division at the time, was positioned near the Imjin River in the lead up to this battle. To the south, the 10th BCT was supported by the US 65th Infantry Regiment, and to the east, the Turkish Brigade. The PVA's offensive reached the 10th BCT's position at Yultong Hill at around 8pm on the 22nd of April 1951. The PVA softened the Filipinos up with mortar and artillery fire, and then stormed in for the kill. Atiaga's platoon was surrounded in the early hours of the following morning, after a long night of intense combat. Seeing that the 10th BCT was getting shredded by the numerically superior Chinese force, the 10th's commander was ordered to withdraw. But not all of his officers were interested in tucking tail and leaving Atiaga and his men alone on the hill. Funnily enough, Yap's company was never really supposed to be fighting on its feet. 
It was an armored company, but Yap never received the Sherman tanks his American allies had promised him. He had access to some M24 light tanks, but a significant portion of the tank company participated in the battle as infantry, including, of course, Atsiaga's platoon. Based on the information we have, it seems that Yap was not inside a tank when he decided to act against the commands of his superiors and rush to the aid of his stalwart first lieutenant. Under an unending barrage of mortar and artillery fire, Captain Conrado Yap crawls from foxhole to foxhole, emboldening his men for the task ahead. Even as he's doing this, they're dying all around him, ripped limb from limb by shockwaves and shrapnel. He has to act now. With complete disregard for his own safety, Yap foregoes all cover and rushes to the hill. His men are close behind. When they breach the crest of the hill, they find Artiaga's position already overrun with PVA. All hell breaks loose. The hilltop is a savage melee, fought on piles of dead bodies. The PVA troops surrounding the hill open fire, gunning down Yap's company from all sides. But the Filipinos don't let up, and their desperation ultimately shines through as, against all odds, they wrest control of the hill from the Chinese. There's no time to celebrate though. In fact, there's little to celebrate. Most of the platoon has been wiped out. Yap clambers through the dead and comes face to face with a sight that enrages him, Atiaga's bloody corpse. Stealing himself, he orders his men to recover as many fallen comrades as they can and then regroup with the rest of the 10th BCT. Under intense PVA fire, Yap's company managed to extricate three dead soldiers from the mess that is Yultong Hill, Atiaga included. When they're on their way out though, Yap looks back and sees one straggler on the slope of the hill, bleeding out. To go back for the man, Yap knows is suicide, but he doesn't care. With a leave no man behind attitude, Yap begins at a pace toward the hill, only to be cut down by a burst of enemy fire. In the end, Yap may have got to Yultong Hill too late to save Atiaga, but his daring actions did lead to the recovery of at least one squad from Atiaga's platoon and Atiaga's body. Those men were probably pretty happy about that and more than appreciative of Artiaga's and Yap's bravery and sacrifice. The Philippine and United States armies were too. Yap received a posthumous Medal of Valor from the Philippine army, while both men received posthumous Distinguished Service Crosses from the US army. Artiaga's citation read, Throughout the night, his platoon was repeatedly assaulted by a fanatical and numerically superior hostile force of Chinese communists. With utter disregard for his safety, Lieutenant Atsiaga moved about the sector held by his men to steady, encourage, and deploy them to ensure the best defense of their positions. Despite exhaustion, isolation from other elements of the company, and the disaster which seemed imminent, his troops tenaciously repulsed repeated attacks and inflicted numerous casualties. While tirelessly directing the fire of his depleted force, he was mortally wounded, but his courage and indomitable fighting spirit so imbued his troops with a spirit of irrepressible determination that they held the positions until relief arrived. Of course, that relief was Captain Yap, whose distinguished service cross read, Learning that his first platoon had been overrun, and despite orders to withdraw his unit, he fearlessly led a daring charge in a determined effort to reach the beleaguered platoon. Overwhelming enemy strength and heavy fire received from flanks, they relentlessly pressed the assault, regained the hill, evacuated the casualties, and rescued the isolated unit. Observing a stricken soldier on the slope of the hill, Captain Yap immediately started toward the men, but was mortally wounded by a burst of enemy fire. Captain Yap's display of courage, devotion to duty, and inspiring leadership reflect the highest credit on himself and the army of the Republic of the Philippines. Overall, Atsiaga and Yap's bravery contributed in no small part to the eventual victory of the 10th BCT in the Battle of Yultong which Filipino Major Maximo Young, a participant, deemed the greatest Filipino victory in the Korean War. We're interested to hear what you think though. 
Had you heard of First Lieutenant Jose M. Arteaga or Captain Conrado Yap before today? What about the Battle of Yultong? Also, how did you enjoy this double feature? Would you like to see more videos like this in the future? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comments, especially if you're from the Philippines. We'd love to hear from you. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.